Good morning. <laughs> Good morning once again. I always avoid my voice to be hard on the mic when I'm singing because they would be confused. They will not be able to sing again. This is one gift. My only hope is when Jesus returns. Are you doing well? How was your week? Cold, but you're looking warm in your heart. <laughs> wow, 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 are you able to shout to someone you're looking good? Just appreciate someone. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Today I want to invite you to Mindset Part 6. And I hope the series is not too long. And today we'll be doing Mindset 17 and 18. I'll cover two. Greed and generous mindset. That's what I'll be covering right now. Greed versus generous mindset. So let's start with mindset number 17. If you are following me for the very first time on Facebook, on YouTube, you might want to go back and look for mindset number 1 to mindset number 16. So let's talk about greed mindset. How do you know whether you have this mindset or someone you know has this mindset? Let, let's first face it. All of us are guilty of wanting more. As human beings, we always want what we don't have. It's never enough. But being ambitious is not synonymous with being greedy. So as I explain greed mindset, I don't want you to imagine I'm discouraging ambition. There's nothing wrong with money. Sometimes when a preacher speaks, people misquote him later. The Bible has never, ever fought money. What the Bible fights is the love of money. And the two are different. First Timothy 6.6 6, But the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. The love of money. So let's not confuse issues. So how do you know whether you or someone else has greed mindset? Let me tell you five things. Five things to know someone with a greed mindset. Number one, they are never satisfied. They are never fulfilled. It does not matter what you give them. They will want something else. If God blesses them with a car, they want another one. Scripture says contentment with godliness is great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. That's not lack of ambition. But it does mean you are not coveting your brother's property. Your brother's wife. You are not coveting your sister's husband. You are not coveting your sister's house or what they have. Now, people who are never satisfied, people who never have enough, compromise their health looking for money. They will put 16 hours every day, risk their money, forfeit their marriage, forfeit their children, forfeit everything, forfeit church. They can't come to church. They deliberately schedule to work on Sunday to accumulate wealth, to accumulate money. They have no time for God, no time for family, no time for their own health, no time even for their own leisure. They neglect partner, life partner, they neglect Everything. They neglect their own happiness. These are people with greed mindset. Jesus taught in Luke 12, 15. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Meaning, your self-worth is not your net worth. Your value is not your valuables. The true measure of your value has nothing to do with what you have. So learn to put your trust on what you cannot lose. Put your confidence on what cannot be taken away from you. You can lose your job. You can lose your business. You can lose your spouse. You can lose your house. You can lose your car. You can lose your money. Put your confidence in what cannot be taken away from you. These are the true riches. Your trust, your confidence 
must be in God. Anything else can be lost. Hebrews 13.5 Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Here's the deal. It's not that we are fighting a bishop, but we are saying your confidence should be this. God holds our tomorrow. God holds our future. And because he lives, we shall live also. And because he lives, we can put our confidence on that fact. He's alive forevermore. Let's not put our confidence on material things. So number one, people with greed mindset are never satisfied. Even if you double their salary, they will still work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not a question of how much they have. They have a greed mindset. That's it. They feel a lot of pain, not accumulating. Number two, people with greed mindset, number two, they are corrupt. They are corrupt. Corruption is not a factor of what you have or don't have. People don't steal government money because they are poor. It's a state of mind called greed mindset. Ecclesiastes 5.10 Whoever loves money never has enough. People who are corrupt, they put their trust on riches. Proverbs 11.28 Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Proverbs 13.11 Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little, it grows. People who steal their way to wealth, to riches, they make sudden money. When they die, check them out. Three years later, all that money is lost. I don't know what happens, but nobody keeps their money. Not their children, nor their trustees. The Bible already says that money dwindles away. But what is gathered little by little stays. Proverbs 15, 27. The greedy bring ruin to their households. But the one who hates bribes will live. I have seen this with my eyes. People who stole government money. Their kids are lost in drugs. Lost in alcohol. Sick. Imprisoned. They bring ruin to their households. Even generations after them. There is no blessing with corrupt money, with stolen money. Corruption is a fruit. The root cause is a greed mindset. That's the root cause. How do you know people are possessed by greed mindset? Number three, they are jealous. They have envy. They feel bad when they see someone else succeed. A classmate who is promoted, who is a director in a company, they wish these guys can lose a job. They see someone else buy a nice car, they wish this guy can get a road accident. They never celebrate others. They are jealous with other people's success. Please understand as a church, Psalm 75, 6, promotion neither comes from the east or from the west or from the south. It's God who leads someone. It's God who decides the next president, whether you like him or not. It's God who decides the next billionaire. No matter how hard you work, we will teach principles of working hard, but promotion comes from God. It's not about our strategies. Promotion comes from God. I repeat, Psalm 75, verse 6. In other words, do your best and leave the rest to God. It is God who leads people. It is not a reflection of your wisdom or intelligence or strategies. Don't confuse stuff. You do your best, but it's God who promotes people. And he made Nebuchadnezzar to understand that. It was not his military tactics that put him in power. It was the God of heaven. This is a man who was not born again. But God told him, I'm the one who puts up kings and removes them. All leaders, whether they know Christ or not, they are put into position in that season for God's purpose in that season. 
How do you know people are jealous? James 3.16 For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. You know someone is jealous when they cut corners to succeed. They have substandard products and services. They don't care how they make money so long as they make money. Because they are in an unhealthy competition. So the Bible says there is disorder and vile practice. Black market in today's language. Now, greed mindset, number four. Greed mindset. I said five things. Number four. People with greed mindset, they don't pay their debts. They will borrow you money, but they will never repay. Your money is lost. They feel pain giving. Even when they are giving what is not theirs. Psalms 37, 21. The wicked borrow and do not repay. But the righteous give generously. The wicked borrow and they do not repay. Refusing to pay debt is wickedness. Romans 13, 8. Oh, no man anything but the continuing debt of love. This is God's prayer for each of his children. That we don't owe any man, any human, anything except the continuing debt of love. Now, Genesis 15, 6, and repeated in Genesis 28, 12. You shall lead to many and borrow from none. I can see your writing notes. And preaching is not just about teaching you. It's not just about giving information. So I want you to look at my eyes just for a minute. Look at my eyes for a minute. Each one of you. I now prophesy in Jesus' name. In 2021, you shall owe nobody nothing. You will close the ear with no debt. You shall lead to many and borrow from none. In Jesus' name. Will you receive it? Great mindset, number five. Number five. They are mean. They are mean. Proverbs 28. By the way, the Bible talks so much about people who are mean. So much. Let me just give you a few passages. Proverbs 28, 22. The stigy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. Can you believe that? The Bible says they are trying to accumulate money, but they never get it. People who are stingy. Psalms 41, 1 to 3. I'm reading from NLT. Psalms 41, 1 to 3. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he will be blessed on earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. The people who are not mean, God promises to sustain them. Guess where? Even on their sickbed. That's amazing. You will sustain him on his sickbed. The Bible even says he will keep him alive. Meaning? They will live all the days God had planned for them. No premature death. The opposite of the mean people. Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever shut their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. The moment you ignore the poor, God says, when you're in trouble, I shut my ears. Your prayers go nowhere. Proverbs 11. 24 to 25. One person gives freely, yet gains more. Another withholds and dewy, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Amazing. When you try to hold, guess what you get? The Bible says poverty. Proverbs 11, 24. Check it out. Everyone who has succeeded... Somehow, they give. If they succeeded in the area of finances and business, and they have lived long in good health, 
check it out. They give. They understand this principle of God. Even though they may not even be born again. Generosity mindset. Number 18. Generous mindset. Number 18. Generous mindset. Now, if you want to know people are generous or whether you are generous, there are three things to check. One, people who are generous are grateful for what they have. They are grateful for the roof on their head. They are grateful for the clothes they have, the house they have, the jobs they have. They don't complain about what God has given them. They are grateful for the people God has given them. The family God has given you. The church God has given you. They don't complain. They are grateful. So if they realize something is not right at home, they fix it. Something is not right at church, they fix it. Something is not right in their workplace, they fix it. They don't complain. They are grateful. Number two, they are fulfilled. They are satisfied with their lives. That does not mean they lack ambition, but they are happy. They have fulfillment. People who are greedy, people with greed mindset are never happy. Because they are never satisfied. They are always looking for more. During this week, Thanksgiving week, people with a generous mindset were able to enjoy the work of their hands. They could sit down and enjoy a meal with their family. They are happy people. They are fulfilled. And number three, people with a generous mindset give. They look for opportunities to give and they give. Did you know there are people who come to church? I'm not talking about our church. I'm just saying church. You, you have been in church for many years. And you have observed this. They keep hoping people will forget to pass the offering basket. There are people who look for every opportunity not to give. Well, whether there is a burial or a wedding, they hope somebody will forget. People with a generous mindset will even ask for opportunities. Is there something we can do to help? How can we help that family? They even reach out to help. Church, I would like to teach you four life-changing principles about generosity. And the reason I wanted to teach this mindset today is because this is the culmination of the Thanksgiving week. Four principles that will change your life. You will never forget them. Principle number one. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above. Meaning, if the gift is good and perfect, the Bible says the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. So if you have any good gift, whether it's your husband, whether it's your mom, whether it's your child, whether it's a house, whether it's a job, whether it's a car, if that gift is good, meaning it's not destroying you, then that gift is from above. It's not from you. It's from above. When you understand that, you appreciate everything you have with humility. You don't brag about it. You don't try to be showy because it's a gift. You didn't earn it. It's a gift every Christian must understand. You have not earned anything you have. It's a gift. Oh, Doc, haven't you been teaching us it's about our attitude? It is God who gave you the right attitude to make money. He works in us both to will and to do. He can take away that mind and you eat grass like Nebuchadnezzar. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So people who understand this, they are humble. They recognize everything is a gift. Now, today being Thanksgiving Sunday, I want to take my mercy out for lunch. I need $100 right now. Is there anyone here who can give me $100 right now? Not your offering, not your tithe. I need $100 for lunch right now. Who will be the first? <laughs> oh my God, this is too much. I was looking for the first one. Good, thank you, Ivy. Let me confirm. Three. Oh, good, thank you so much. 
This is a hundred dollars. Wow, this is so powerful. Let me tell you something. I saw three, four, five hands up, but I be rushed here. The reason is simple. It's not because she's my daughter, no. It's because I gave her the money. And I said when I asked it in church, I wanted to rush forward <laughs> and give me the money. She understood it was not her money. There were no emotions. <laughs> I just wanted you to understand the principle. When you understand everything is from God, when he asks, you rush. Because it was not yours in the first place. So there was no argument between me and Ivy. I told her, I will give this story in church. When I ask for money, I want you to rush forward and give me back my money. That is why, while there were hands up, Ivy's behavior was different. She gave it my way. The way I wanted it. I wanted to see it that way. That it's God who has given you everything. So when he asks you 10%, you don't argue with him because 100% was his gift. I gave Ivy $20, five of them, five bills of $20. If I told her I only want one of the bills, which is 20%, she could not have argued. I've demanded 100%. Why? She understood from the word go, it was not her money. She was keeping for me. She was a custodian. She was just a steward. We must have that attitude that everything we have is a gift from God. So when God tells you to do something, if I had time and I'll do this another day, maybe in the future, I'll share with you my personal testimonies and that of other people to show you what people have received because of going that extra mile to obey God. When they understood it was never theirs. The reason we hold so strong, we think this is my hard-earned money. This is the highest form of ignorance. Hard-earned money cannot come from the mouth of a believer. You recognize it's God who gives you the health. It is God who gives you the opportunity to work. The Bible says it is God who gives us the power to make wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18 Don't ever say with your lips, those are words of a heathen. Hard-earned money. Where there are people who are right now bedridden. It's all a gift from above. There are people who wanted to go to school like you. But there was no school fees. There are people who may have wanted to be in this country, but they are not. It is all a gift from God. That needs to sink. Four principles about generosity. Principle number two. We are blessed to bless. And let me repeat. This being Thanksgiving Sunday, I need you to understand there is no Thanksgiving without giving. And that's why I want to teach this. We are blessed to bless. Period. Now, in Deuteronomy 22.18, the Bible says all nations will be blessed through you. And the Apostle Paul repeated that about Abraham. God told Abraham, Galatians 3.8, the original story, Genesis twenty-two eighteen. the original story. Abraham, all nations of the earth will be blessed through you. In other words, I'm blessing you, Abraham, to bless other nations. I'm blessing you for the sake of many nations. Paul writes to the church at Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 11, You will be made rich in every way. So that you can be generous on every occasion. That means people who are generous, God will always ensure you have something to give in every occasion. Every wedding you're invited, every burial committee you're invited, every single occasion you're invited, every given opportunity, be it visiting an imprisoned person, a sick person, you are always looking for an opportunity to give. So Paul tells them, because of your generosity, God will ensure you will always have something to give. What's that? Your hands will be channels of blessings. So God blesses you to the extent you will bless others. You will never be blessed beyond your commitment to bless others. Let me to prove to you biblically. By the way, there are people who make money and they are not generous. 
They are rich but very poor. That's a fact of life. There are people who make money and they are not generous. I hear people saying nobody is rich who is not generous. That's not true. But let me tell you what happens to people who make money and they are not generous. Jesus himself gave the story of such two rich people. Let me tell you their Ed story. One of them, he called him the rich fool. He made a lot of money. Luke 12, 13 to 21. The Bible calls him the rich fool. Why? He made money in today's language. He reached financial independence. My heart make merry. Enjoy. Eat. Drink. Sleep. You have no need to ever work again. You have accumulated enough for the rest of your days. God came and said, you fool. Your soul is required tonight. Why does the Bible call him fool? There could be many reasons. I'll only tell you one. The Bible never mentions he had a wife or a son or a daughter. He lived for himself alone. He had zero business with anyone else. My soul, my soul, make merry. It was all about me, 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 and myself. And God says, you are a fool. You are never created to eat. Get out of the here. Let me take away my breath. And the second rich man the Bible talks about, Jesus himself talks about, is Luke 16, 19 to 31. He ignored a poor man by the name Lazarus. The Bible never says he committed adultery. Jesus never said he murdered anyone. The only sin mentioned is ignoring a poor man, Lazarus. The man went to hell. Now, by the way, I need to repeat this until it sinks. Jesus never gave a myth. The way we give myths about the tortoise and the rabbit. The so-called parables in the Bible are events that literally happened in human history. Jesus was not creating a story for illustration the way we do. These were not made of grandmothers. That's why he was giving exact names. The only name that is not mentioned is the name of the rich man. Why? The memory of the wicked disappears. All the other people are mentioned. The poor man is Lazarus. The rich man looks at in heaven, sees Lazarus seated by the bosom of Abraham. Real story, real people. And asks for a drop of water. And Abraham replies, uh -uh, you had your heyday on earth. Now, this is Lazarus' day to feast forever. Feasting at the table of the Lord. The only sin mentioned is ignoring a poor man whose woods were licked by the dog, living by the gate. He could not get food. Like many Americans who treat dogs better than human beings, this is exactly what happened with this man. Psalms 112, 1 to 9. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord. And by the way, follow this text closely. Because the fear of the Lord here is about looking at the poor. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the Lord. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. For those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous, good will come to those who are generous and led freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their home will be lifted high in honor. 
They will not fear pandemics like corona. Their memory will start forever. Long after they are gone, people will be using them as frames of reference. Their children will be established in the Lord. They will be mighty in the Lord. Long after they are gone, those who are generous with the poor, God makes a promise to take care of their children's children. You don't need to worry how your children will be, the values they will take long after you're gone, because God will take care of them. They are blessings Solomon experienced because of the generosity of his father David. God refused to destroy Solomon, who was in idolatry. A lot of believers didn't know that. All because of the righteousness of his father David. And you'd be surprised. This righteousness was about worship. And there was no worship without giving. David says, I'll enter your gates with praise. I'll enter your gates with thanksgiving. What's that? He used to carry a bull. It was not lip service. That was the thanksgiving in those days. Because of the righteousness of David, God protected Solomon from his wrath. Solomon got into idolatry because of his lust for women. But because of the righteousness of David, God protected him in accordance to his word. The kingdom was scattered after Solomon left the scene. Four generosity principles. Four principles about generosity to remind you, number one, every good and perfect gift is from God. Number two, we are blessed to bless. Number three, we are tested with what we have. We are tested with what we have. So many people believe they will give when they have more. When they get a job. When they get established in business. When they get promoted. No. God does not test you with what you don't have. God tests you with what you have. And I'm using the word test deliberately. It is only in the area of giving that God tests us. And it's only in the area of giving that God tells us to test him. I'll show you that in a moment. And here's the deal. If God can't trust you with what you have, he can't trust you with what he will give you. If God can't trust you with what he has given you, he cannot trust you with what he will give you. Jesus said in Luke 16, 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Jesus says, if you are dishonest earning 3,000 a month, you will be dishonest earning 10,000 a month. This is the principle. If you can be trusted with $1,000 a month, you can be trusted with $1,000 per month. What's the message? If you want to move from where you are to the next level, pass this class. You don't move from one class to another because of listening to lectures, whether in primary school or high school or college. You don't graduate from one class to the other because you attended class. You graduate from one class to another because of passing the test. You will not pass the test of more wealth, being entrusted by God with more because of listening to my sermons, but because of obeying the word of God. Blessed are not the hearers, but the doers of the word. So the Lord is saying, if you can't be faithful with what I'm giving you, you have not passed the test to the next level. Stay right there. Repeat this class until you pass it. God tested everyone on this area. Everyone. If we were doing a seminar for a week, I would show you chronologically in the Bible. For now, let me refresh your memory with only one test. God tells Abraham, you will be a father of many nations. Then he tests him by saying, bring your son, your only son, whom you have waited for 25 years. I gave you the promise when you are 75. Now you are 100. But the truth is, Abraham didn't wait for the boy for 25 years. He waited for him for 100 years. It was already very taxing to be 75 and barren. And after 100 years, if you can trust me to be the father of many nations, 
I want you to trust me, this one boy, your only son. Sacrifice him. Then God says, now I know Abraham fears the Lord. Imagine all the stories you discuss about Abraham's fear is the fact that he was able to release the only thing God gave him. And God said, I will make you a father of many nations. Now Abraham is the father of many sons, including you and me, and everyone who will inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible calls us children of Abraham. So you cannot be given what you cannot release. The fourth principle and the last one. God does not need your money. God does not need your money. God has never received money from anyone. God is not a beggar. You know, we treat him like a beggar. When I was growing up in Sunday school, we used to take change to church. And my dad used to ensure there are some remaining coins for me to carry to Sunday school. How many are like me? That's how you grew up. Let's just be very honest. How many are like me? Good. You, see, you realize we have to unlearn things we learned. And it's not easy. Because if there was no change, we were not given. We had to be sent to the shop to buy something, to have some sugar in the house. Then the remaining coins, you can go and throw them in the offering basket. Just think about this. You buy a little boy or a little girl some chips, fries, as you call them here. And then as a good mom, as a good dad, you want to fellowship with your little boy. This could be a five-year-old child. And maybe you have tested this. And you decide to pick just one piece. And the boy refuses. Ah, ah, you can't take away my plate. Have you ever gone through that? What does the little boy forget? One, you don't need the chips. You're doing this for fellowship. Two, you could have bought four plates if you so wanted. Five, you could have refused to buy him even the plate he has. He has forgotten even what he has is yours. Every time we refuse to give, we are behaving like that little kid. We are immature. We are yet to mature up in our Christian faith. Trust me, believers, this is one topic that should never be taught to mature Christians. I should be teaching any other lesson. That is the truth. It is a simple understanding that everything belongs to God. Let me refresh your memory. Psalms 50, 9 to 15. And hear what God says. Psalms 50, 9 to 15. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thanksgiving to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. What is God saying? He was telling the Old Testament brothers and sisters, when you sacrifice the bulls, can you have the right attitude? I don't eat the meat of bulls. I don't drink their blood. I don't need anything from you. All the animals in the field are mine. I would have slaughtered hundreds of elephants if I were hungry. I wouldn't ask of you. And make no mistake, I own cattle on a thousand hills. I don't own a thousand cattle. I own cattle on a thousand hills. When I ask you to fulfill your vows, it has nothing to do with me. Verse 15, and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. I'm asking this in your faithfulness to bless you, to honor you. Why? Where your treasures are, there your heart is. I'm testing where your heart is for your sake, to bless you, to honor you, to protect you, not for my sake. I don't need your sacrifice. The insects, the birds, the animals, they are all mine. The world is all mine, says the Lord. Hey, guy. 2 verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. 
Psalms 116.12. The Berean version says, How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? NIV says, How can I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? New King James says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? New Living Translation. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done to me? I want to tell you two things you can do to the Lord for all he has done to you, for the bread of life, for you being alive, for the work you have, for the parents God gave you, the siblings, the children, the life, the spouse, anything God has given you, the clothes. If you are asking like the singer, what shall I render to Jehovah? Let me tell you two things. And then we pray. Number one, you can give to the needy. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is kind to the poor leads to the Lord. King James, whoever gives to the poor leads to the Lord. And he will reward them for what they have done. Every time you give to the poor, you are loaning God. Jesus said something serious. I'll paraphrase. Matthew 25, 42 to 46. I was hungry and you never gave me anything to eat. I was thirsty and you never gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you never invited me in your house. I was an alien, a foreigner, but you never received me. I was naked in a cold winter and you never clothed me. I was sick, you never visited me in the hospital. You never send me flowers or even a card to wish me quick recovery. I was in prison and you condemned me that I'm a criminal when I needed love and compassion. Go to the outer darkness, to everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And they shall ask the Lord, when were you hungry and we never fed you? When were you thirsty and we never gave you a drink? When were you a stranger and we never invited you in our house? When were you naked and we never clothed you? When were you in prison and we never visited you? When were you sick and we never came to that hospital ward? And Jesus will say, in as much as you never did to one of this little of mine, you never did it to me. You workers of iniquity, go to the darkness. That's how serious the Lord takes it. The Bible says so much about ignoring the needy in our society. This Thanksgiving week, make a resolve. As pastors, sometimes we share things not to brag, but to challenge your faith. This week, we supported an organization that is raising money for the seniors. We decided to support 10 seniors. They were looking for money for seniors, and they gave an amount for every senior you want to support. There are always opportunities to give. It's more blessed to give than to receive. What shall I render to the Lord? So number one, the needy. And number two, make sure there is food in the house of God. The house of God. That's the only thing you can do to God. Nothing else. Malachi 3, 16, 6 to 12. Malachi 3, 6 to 12. God explains how the Israelites broke the covenant by withholding the tithes. Verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. The reason I'm saying this, I want to start with verse 6 because there are some people watching me on Facebook right now at YouTube who believe tithe is an Old Testament concept. But they will claim all the blessings in the Old Testament. They will shout, I am the head and never the tail. I will lead to many and borrow from none. They will claim all the old covenant promises, except when it comes to giving. They start saying, hey, this is an old covenant concept. Why? They just don't want to give. Those who don't want to give will say anything. Give us, give without complaining. Mean people look for every excuse not to give. So God begins by saying, I am the Lord, I change not. Don't say I'm the old covenant God or the new covenant God. Verse 6. 
I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful lad, says the Lord Almighty. That's phrase says the Lord Almighty, has been repeated three times in just those six verses. Look at verse 10. Bring the whole tithe. Why? Why would God say the whole tithe? Because believers give. Christians throughout all ages give. The problem is not giving. It is whether they are willing to give the whole tithe. Tithe is 10%. The challenge has never been given. The challenge in church has never been given. The challenge is whether we are willing to give the whole tithe. Imagine, God never leaves any guesswork. He makes himself very clear. Very clear. And then he says those who bring the whole tithe are righteous. Listen at verse 16. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Add verse 18, and you would again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And this righteousness was based on one thing, bringing the whole tithe. God told Abraham when he went to sacrifice his son, now I know Abraham fears the Lord. Those are the words used. Now I know Abraham fears the Lord. The test was in the giving. There are only three ways, precious friends, brothers and sisters, in which you can serve in the kingdom of God. Either you are frontline ministering, preaching the way I'm doing, or number two, you are praying for ministers of the gospel, or number three, you're supporting the kingdom of God by giving, giving your time and giving your money. Giving your time like Nancy and our brother M did here yesterday. This place looked gorgeous, beautiful, because they were here yesterday working on it. Not just giving your money, but giving your time. Let me repeat. There are only three ways you can serve in the kingdom of God. So just be asking yourself whether you are giving, you are serving the, by you coming to church, you are not serving the kingdom of God. This is for your personal edification. You are serving the kingdom of God, number one, when you are frontline preaching, soul winning. Number two, you are praying for ministers. You are interceding for them. You are crying before God to cover them. You don't want the gospel to go where the prayers have never reached. Or number three, you are giving. You are giving your time. You are serving. When you give your time, every hour you spend has a monetary value. Or you are giving your money. And to the givers, I finish with these words. And my God, shall supply all your needs in accordance to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 Have you received the word? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We receive your word with thanksgiving. Before I continue in this prayer, I'd like to pray for everyone who wants to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you're watching me on Facebook, if you're watching me on YouTube, 
you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I am now your child. I am born again. I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. While we are still in prayer, for those who have received Jesus, you have prayed this prayer with me. Please write on this Facebook page, I prayed to be saved. If you write that, I'll identify you, enroll you in my discipleship program. Just write on this Facebook page, I prayed to be saved. For those of you who have been watching me, you're sick, you're needy, I want to pray for you right now. And I encourage you, if you're watching me on Facebook or YouTube, take your tithe to the church which feeds you with the word of God. Obey God's word. And he will open the floodgates of heaven and bless you. And bless your children's children till the Lord returns. This is the Father's promise. Offering you can give anywhere. And if you want to offer with us today, we make provision for you to support the work of God and the ministry we are doing. I'd like to bless you, church. 2021, we are closing in victory. We are leaving every pain behind in 2020. It's been a very eventful year with a lot of stories to be told for generations. We are closing 2021 in victory in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you today. We honor you, O oh God. We bless your holy name. And our Father, I raise my heart by faith. And I prophesy in your presence that your children will be blessed. You bless the work of their hands. We will close into 2021 in victory. Our pocket will be blessed. The devourer will not touch our bank accounts. The devourer will not touch our jobs. The devourer will not touch our children. Dear Lord and God, we bless your holy name for your word. And today, I pray, O oh Father, heal the sick in the name of Jesus. You committed to do it in your word. I speak the word of faith, the word of healing to anyone watching me right now who is ailing in their bodies. I speak their recovery in the name of Jesus. I pray for jobs for the job seekers in the name of Jesus. I pray for promotion in places of work. Promotion from one level to the next level in the name of Jesus. Blessed be your name, O God. Blessed be your name, O God. As we step into this new week, we step in confidence that we are your children. Loved of the Father. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Who keeps his promises. Whose promises are yes in him. And amen in him. We love you Lord. We love you Lord. In Jesus name we pray. Amen and amen.